So there's all sorts of avenues for creatives to really be seen and paid and commissioned in ways that were never options before. Are you looking for ways to shorten your marketing learning curve and help your organization survive and thrive? Welcome to Relish This, the Purpose Marketing Podcast, a show for purpose-focused leaders who want to use marketing techniques to fuel their organization's growth. If you're a returning listener and you haven't subscribed already, we'd love to have you. Also, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Now here's your host, author and marketing specialist, Stu Swinefort. Hey everybody, Stu here. My guest today is T. McDaniel. And they are the founder and curator of Creative Integration Initiative. And if you have anything to do with creativity or the art scene or, or, or how to bring amazing art to the public in the Denver area, uh, this is the show for you. Teague and I had a really fun conversation about being mission aligned, about how to say no to non-mission aligned work. Um, and how to really inject the ecosystem and keep creativity in the ecosystem that is just life. Um, I think that this was just a really fun show. Uh, Teague and I had a lot to talk about in terms of our mutual um, experience with with Denver's art community and uh, just living in the area for, for as long as I have been able to live in the area. I really hope you enjoy the show. Here we go. Good afternoon, Teague. How are you today? Doing well. How about yourself? I am doing great. It's a beautiful day here in the Rocky Mountains, and we're recording this in late August. So uh, coming into this to, into the fall season, I think this will this will air in uh, in as it has gotten a little bit colder, hopefully. But uh, but it's a beautiful day today. Absolutely, it sure is. So you are in the Rhino area of Denver. Um, with your organization. Tell us a little bit about what you do down there. Absolutely. So I actually office out of Rhino um, and in Boulder, but I consider um, myself to be the founder of a nomadic institution, meaning that we're very nimble in terms of location um, and we kind of serve wherever we're fit. Um, my organization's name is Creative Integration Initiative, or CII for short. And with this organization, I partner with other institutions to provide a creative project and collaboration that wouldn't otherwise be possible without the kind of collaboration that we enter into. Yes. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've, that you've helped bring to life uh, during your, your, your um, tenure there. Yeah, absolutely. It really goes through a broad range. Um, but within the last year, I've found myself working a lot in kind of the public sphere, as well as with a lot of projects involving youth. Um, so one project um, that is engaging kind of me as a consultant to find and hire artists, graphic designers, woodworkers, muralists to create a user journey experience that children who are autistic can more accessibly access like the dentist and and have a really meaningful dental experience where they know what to expect and everything is sort of laid out in a way that provides the most accessible kind of sensory experience for the autistic child. So everything from engaging youth in that way to doing guerrilla marketing fundraisers for org an organization called Youth Scene, who um, really give provides a lot of access to resources, mental health resources, other types of community building and group um, therapy, different group settings for trans youth, specifically POGM trans youth, POGM standing for people of the global majority. So coming in um, as a sort of volunteer for that organization and partnering to do pronoun pin activities where people at Boulder Pride actually made their own pronoun pins, um, you know, he, him, she, her, they, them, neo-pronouns, as well as 
identity fat flags like the um, you know, buy flag and different things like that. And that was a fundraiser and an awareness raiser for that organization. So kind of running the gamut of engaging creatives in a format and in a context that um, provides different resources for youth. Oh, that sounds amazing. It's uh, really cool to hear how you're integrating this sort of commercial piece in terms of, of awareness and and marketing and and you know, gorilla, gorilla stuff out there, uh, with the creativity as well. That's, that's a really cool, um, kind of intersection. What, what have you found have been some of the, some of the more interesting ways that you've been able to bridge that gap? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that at the root, it really goes into a values conversation for me as a curator, the root of the word curate is cura. And that means to care for. Traditionally, historically, that may have been like someone caring specifically for a collection of books, as odd as that sounds. But Mm -hmm. as a person who's a curator in the art sector, and especially in the contemporary art sector, I really interpret that um, meaning to be to care for people. Um, The founder of Youth Scene is also a curator by trade. And if you look at Dr. J's organization, they're really providing connections to resources and connections, community connections to trans youth. And kind of the same with my approach to curating um, is really just an approach where if I find that I'm able to care for a body of people, typically that's through an existing body of people, um, through an organization that already has a body of constituents, that that's really a a, a format where I can kind of complete my my goal as a curator to provide meaningful connections, meaningful art experiences through artful engagements in the pu- public sphere. And so um, really tapping into those already established communities like libraries, um, public art funds, commercial businesses, nonprofits, and partnering with them to see, you know, who are they impacting? And that's what makes it, you know, really initiative based. And, and where I find a lot of the joy is by finding out the who we're impacting from these organizations, because they already have a group of people they're serving. I just come in to initiate something that couldn't be accessed or, you know, contributions that couldn't be made possible otherwise. Yeah, it's fascinating work. I um I just love the idea of taking curation kind of to this next level where it's not just about um you know m- massaging a, a an art gallery or um or even you know e- even a museum type of thing. That's where you tend to hear that language be used, but the way that you're you're approaching this from from the variety of different audiences that are are going to interact with that. Um, how did you, how did you get started in, in art? Yeah. Um, I heard a statistic in high school that said something like less than half of people ended up using the major in their college degree for their work, but that people still made more if they went to college. And as a person whose parents told me, well, we didn't save for you, you probably won't be able to go or it'll be really difficult. I didn't really see myself going to college. And then I had a mentor um, in my school who was also the school counselor and the college counselor. So guidance counselor and kind of the person who coordinated college. And she kept telling me, yeah, you're going to go. Yeah, you're going to go. And I'm like, okay, I'll apply but I want to apply for something I really want to learn. And I, you know, I've been teaching a lot and volunteering a lot. And I just really was making art at night as an only child. Like I just had a lot of time alone in the evenings. Um, And so I decided to go to school for art because it's something that I found really frustrating and hard to do, but also pretty intriguing and something I wanted to get good at. And so I initially just went to school for a college degree and thought, well, I don't want to become a professional artist, but I do want to learn more about this thing. So I decided to go for something that I was really, really intrigued by and passionate about, and then started working in the gallery in my first year and decided that professionally, I thought that being a curator would be 
kind of the best path because in art school, no one wanted to be a curator. So I was like, oh, great. This is not a competitive job, which is <laughs> not actually the case, but that's okay. Yeah, it's funny. Fine art is is an interesting beast. I went to, I mean, you, you mentioned people not using their, their degree. I, I went to school um, and I actually got my degree in sociology, which I suppose I use to some extent, but, um, but my major area of focus was in uh, as a kind of a pre-med curricula. And um, when I got into med school, I pretty quickly started assessing whether or not that was exactly the right path for me. And I decided it wasn't and ended up staying with, um, with what I was doing at the time, which was, which was writing copy and, um, and that type of stuff, which then evolved into being a graphic designer and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I remember at the time my brother was in college, uh, at DU getting his fine art degree and he, um, one day he kind of was like, oh, commercial art, that's just, that's just a sellout. And I was like, man, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to, how to pay for paint. And he pretty quickly f figured that out as well. And, um, and he's now, uh, in computer art and he does a, a lot of kind of, you know, 3d animation stuff now, um, where he took his fine art degree and applied it in, in a similar way. But yeah, it's a, it's amazing what you can, what you can take out of those experiences. And that, that's a really, uh, this, I just really like that you said, oh, well, no one really seems to want to do this, that there's an opening there. That's, that's pretty neat. Have you worked in, um, as, as a curator in other mechanisms or have you pretty much applied it to your current initiative, you know, since you got out of school? Yeah. I mean, I guess I've been curating in some capacity since, 2011 um, and working in galleries. So I've worked in kind of museum type settings as well as commercial galleries as a gallery manager um, who I was basically like the assistant director because I was the only employee besides the owner and it was like an artist run space. Um, and then creative integration initiative has actually existed in some capacity under its previous name, Leto, L-E-T-O, um, projects since 2018. And so doing independent curating through that and then other types of curating before that as well. Um, I also worked for a commercial art firm called Nine Dot Arts, and they work, you know, they've done everything from the art at Dairy Block Alley with the, you know, LED integrated sidewalks to... I was really heavily involved in the 20 year public art master plan um, for the airport when I was there um, and have kind of done some other public art and master planning things since. So I think that once I said the word curate um, and then tried to narrow into experiences within that, I've worked in everything from, you know, Kunsthal, which means non-collecting. They don't own any art, um, mm -hmm. art museums that are experimental and nomadic. And we had, you know, through Black Cube, um, things like satellite exhibitions for the Venice Biennale, um, all the way to, you know, my friends live in the back of the gallery and I'm hosting their first show and so, and everything in, in between. And so it's really just, um, you know, kind of that art market space, which is a much smaller concentric circle than say the art business or the whole art world, art world being the largest bucket of anyone who's making something and calling it a piece of art. And then art business being, you know, anything engaging in even experiences of art, um, more like things like Meow Wolf, where people are going for an entertainment experience. And then in the art market specifically, where it's just the purchase and sale of art goods and specifically curation. So I, yeah, I've found a lot of different variety within that um, Colorado, just being a still a kind of an emerging city to be a curator in. Yeah, I mean Denver has definitely been changing quite a bit um over the over the last 20 years in particular and and it does feel like the art scene here is is starting to mature and um and grow up and it's cool to hear how you're playing your part in in that growth. How um it, 
at CII, my guess is that you have kind of a variety of different clientele that you that you serve. How what what's the main way that people find out about you? I have generated everything by word of mouth. Okay. So relationships. Yeah. It's a lot of relationship building and we're actually on a wait list. Um, and I do have some scalable business models and business plans that I do plan on enacting at some point, but for right now, just building up a really strong portfolio of projects where I'm kind of the key organizer of that, the, you know, kind of key project manager and curator. And then I do um, have some kind of support in the curatorial realm from, you know, other kind of ad hoc employees as well, but really just being able to have a smaller body of work and smaller clientele for right now really lets me um, kind of guide the quality um, mm -hmm. and create a lot of baseline systems to be able to expand in a way that is really sustainable. Um, I really like some slow growth business models and find <laughs> that um, I'm not necessarily like looking to, to quadruple overnight. That being said, even sometimes with word of mouth, I'll have, you know, four new clients in a week and, you know, I think I have 17 things in bid stage and eight active clients um, and like 12 projects wrapping up right now. So it's, it's not wow. a small, <laughs> it's not a small client load at the moment. Oh, that sounds, um, that sounds exciting. Do you feel like that's because we're kind of coming into whatever this next phase of the pandemic will be, but at least it's, it feels a little bit more a little bit more freeform than we have been over the last couple of years? Is it, is it because the, the scene is opening back up or, or what do you attribute that kind of volume of, of, uh, of workload to? This is probably the most kind of abstract answer. And you can poke at me for something more business oriented because I am almost through my PMP as well, but I equate it to the page in the children's book, um, what to do with an idea when it's like this little kid has an idea and it's this egg walking around with a cr golden crown. And one day the egg cracks and it goes from being something that is just like the kid's idea that the kid is like watering and thinking about and having more ideas about. And then when the egg cracks, it just is a part of everything else. I think that you hit a critical mass of putting energy into, you know, a body of artwork or a business or, you know, whatever it may be. And then there's this critical mass that happens and it just becomes something beyond you. I think that um, I hit that critical mass at a certain point earlier this year and it just sort of started to exist on its own. And it's something that I, I tend to now rather than it's something that I'm trying to birth or create or explain. Yeah. It's like a snowball effect, right? You've, it just starts rolling and then just gets going way faster than, than it originally was just with that initial, that initial energy that you put in. And it sounds like you've been very intentional about not only the growth, but, uh, but just the way that, that you've been building, um, you know, building out, CII. What, how did you, how did you do that? Most people get pretty excited at the onset and, and start running before they've even learned how to crawl. Um, but it sounds like you've been able to throttle that, uh, that particular, oh, challenge, I guess, <laughs> and, and keep it, keep it manageable. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it is that I'm really intentional about which projects to take on. Um, you know, I, I really want partnerships to be something that is mission aligned. Our mission is to um, create a world like, I guess, sorry, we're basically a, a beacon of creative vitality. Um, and we do that through the curation of visual arts, workshops, education, and initiatives. Um, and then the vision is a, a world of widespread creativity. Um, and that's within the guise of having equitable access for art 
for all. Um, and so I think that having a really clear guiding set of values, um, we're inclusive, we're creative, um, we're collaborative, um, we're innovative and being really initiative driven, knowing exactly what that is, has guided me to only take on projects that I have the capacity for to either manage or hire out. And also that are really aligned with that vision of, you know, what we exist to do. Cause we, you know, I don't necessarily exist to hang a really pretty piece of art above someone's couch in, you know, a several million dollar home. Like that's not exactly what we exist for. And we could do that and we could find meaning in that. Um, but just evaluating, making sure that partnerships are at least two out of three, right. Profitable, (laughs) um, mission aligned and like it's a it's a in the collaborative like the collaborative partner is a, is really in line with um you know is an opportunity for us if we hit two out of three of those um then we're smooth sailing and so you know it, it wasn't like i was trying to get every art consulting gig on the block um which uh-huh. which automatically lends to a slow growth process i've also been keeping you know, high stakes, full-time jobs and raising small children and buying a house and raising animals, as you can hear in the background and, you know, managing my own art practice at the same time. And so over the years, I had just stepped back from each of those responsibilities and put more energy into this business. Um, But, you know, having all those other things going on and then having a really strong mission, vision and guiding values has helped balance that process of, slow growth and intentional growth. I I love hearing you say that that's how you've how you've managed to accomplish that. I think that that there's so many people out there who are who are scared to to say no to the to the wrong things. Um and you know either either that's because they're um you know they're they're challenged with with money or, or fear of missing out or whatever those things are. Um, but, but sticking to one's, uh, you know, one's mission and one's, one's you know, core values, I think is, is incredibly important. And it's really, really great to hear how you've managed to do that. Um, you know, I found that when we're working on projects that we're, that are very mission aligned, that those are the ones that I'm most excited to work on. Um, and so subsequently we have gone out and tried to try to do more work in those areas that, that are, you know, th- that we do have clients who are, who are excited about, about, uh, the excited about the opportunities and the challenges ahead of them that are really looking to grow, that understand where they're trying to go, and that are trying to do something to help uh, help the world or or other people out. Um, you know, when we when we can get as many of those checked off as possible, um, those projects tend to tend to run around run along very smoothly, and and uh, and they're very fulfilling. So it's cool that you that you put that f- forward early on. You mentioned that you that you you know are wearing quite a few hats or have uh, have a few other projects going. Uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the stuff that you do outside of CII. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite things that I do right now outside of that capacity is write um, as the art writer for Outfront Magazine. So it's kind of this fun intersection between um, you know my queer community as well as the art community where I have a chance to go out and their mission is to amplify queer voices. And so doing that by researching and interviewing um, queer artists and really, you know, spotlighting some different aspects of of the queer art community has been a really fun opportunity. Um, I also generally publish about one to four things a year between being a guest on blog posts, interviews, podcasts. Um, I have an ongoing research partner um, and my research partner and mentor, Um, And I have been working through grant funding through the National Endowment for the Arts to make the first survey of the United States art market. And so we measure the art market 
And ironically, we measured 2019 data. So it just, you know, that was our first year of doing this every year. And so it kind of hit at an interesting time with COVID. And we're like, okay, this is great. And so he's kind of going, Jeffrey, Dr. Jeff. Hey, Teague, I lost you for some reason. Can you hear me? Do you have me back? I have you back, yes. Oh, I think my screen locked. I'm so sorry. When did, um, That's you... okay. Um, you know, I think we may have captured it. <clears throat> um, I just couldn't hear you for some reason, um, but it looks like it recorded. Um, you kind of dropped off right when you were talking about Dr. Jeffrey. Sure. So Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Taylor is kind of taking that research in the direction of measuring the fluctuations in the size of the art market as it's been impacted by COVID. And I'm looking to eventually ex extrapolate some of that data to talk about disparities and discrepancies in terms of racial inequality in professions of the arts business, specifically curators, because this um, art market data measures a lot more. So, you know, kind of ongoing research as well as the writing, um, publishing, and then um, I'm a social practice artist. And so keeping my body of work active, um, I'm really a project-based artist. So whatever the idea is, I'll find, you know, something that an art medium that'll work to produce that. So everything from printmaking to right now social practice, which means uh, basically participatory artwork where the medium is community and engaging with folks. And so that series is called Post Gender Euphoria, and it's imagining, giving opportunities to playfully imagine a post-gender society. So between kind of the publishing, the researching, my own art practice, um, and then kind of some of those intersections into queer communities, and then teaching, um, at the, you know, at the university level, that kind of fills out um, the sort of body of work that I want to be doing. You're doing a lot. <laughs> that's just, that's just a lot of, uh, a lot of irons in the fire there. I, I love it. Um, it's just amazing. Oh, yeah, getting my PMP too, and just got a certain graphic design. I'm just like, yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're a busy person. That's amazing. So you you mentioned early on that you that you have a lot of projects that are working with kids. Are, tell us more about some of those projects and how how they're affecting and impacting um, youth. And, and is it bringing bringing youth into the art world as well? Tell us tell us more about that. Yeah, so I'd say yes and no. Um, a lot of these are creative experiences for youth. Um, okay. One that I will speak very vaguely about right now, I think, is an exemplar kind of project, but it's also not been released to the public. So um, here's kind of a, a high level sneak preview. So, you know, kind of getting kiddos to make their own artwork and then having that presented in a public capacity and then having kids be able to come and see themselves represented back in front of them through graphics that are, you know, professionally produced and installed in public spaces. Um, so kind of this imagination based engagement where, you know, children are getting this experience of imagining a picture or a character and drawing that out and then having that be refined by professional artists and, you know, graphic designers to refine those to a level that they can be produced publicly. And then those characters that all the different children drew, or at least the ones that were selected, are going to be placed throughout environments um, in this context of a scavenger hunt. And so really figuring out different ways to engage the public um, and finding out different ways to, yeah, basically fulfill sort of a niche that, you know, otherwise kids wouldn't be engaged in that way and wouldn't yeah. have themselves reflected back in public in that way. And it's sort of this thing to empower the, empower the child and empower their imagination and their creativity. Yeah. I think I've seen something like that in before where there was an artist whose, 
I think his daughter was drawing, um, drawing things and he would take them and, and like professionally digitize them, um, and, and kind of bring them to life in a, in a whole new way. Um, but she was the, the, like the originator of the concept. And it was just so cool to see, um, uh, to see how he would take these, these great kid ideas and, and then, and then bring them, you know, to a, you know, a, a little bit more professional level, not that they weren't great as kid ideas, but, uh, but it was just cool to see that transition. Oh, I absolutely but then, love that. Yeah. But then to see that in what you're the, you know, where you're taking that and see that again in public, I can imagine as a, as a, as a kid, that would be just a, a thrilling experience to see this, this creature that you imagined and, and drew, um, kind of come to fruition in, in a public setting. That's pretty, that's a pretty cool concept. I love it. Thank you. So in terms of, in terms of the art world in, in, in Denver in particular, what, what are some of the things that you've noticed? You, it sounds like you've been engaged and involved in, in the area for quite some time. What are some of the things that you've noticed most about how, how Denver's art scene has changed? Yeah, I never thought that I would be able to make a career in the arts as a person who grew up here. It's completely different. Um, there's probably 50 times the number of murals than there used to be. Um, and a lot of the developers have a specific line item in their development that is for their art programs. Right. And they just, mm -hmm. yep, that's the line item. Like go find a consultant, go do this. And so there's all sorts of avenues for creatives to really be seen and paid and, commissioned in ways that were never options before. There's also red line residency, right? We're still residency deficient. We've got Anderson Ranch, um, you know, but that's a four hour drive from Denver. And then red line is, you know, still can only accommodate a select number of artists, but it still provides so much more opportunity for professional development, community building, things that never existed before. Um, and I think that whether you are a writer or a poet or in theater, you know, a visual artist, a graphic designer, you're going to find opportunities for free, accessible, professional development. And I have a lot of resources that I could talk your ear off all day about, you know, all the different, we're opportunity saturated, right? For, um, for right. creatives right now in terms of how to change your side hustle into a full-time gig, how to do your taxes, copyright, all these things, live content, live content that's recorded, um, networking, and so there's, it's, we're pretty opportunity saturated for creatives for those markets, as well as opportunity saturated for people to be hired as creatives in their capacity. And so it just has transformed from one small art district and some, you know, really core foundational members of the art community that have been strong players for a long time into a really dynamic ecosystem that's a lot more sustainable and can hold a lot more diversity in terms of experimental art, emerging art, young art, you know, collectors. We have a up and coming collector base that's a lot more prolific. And so it, it really has just turned into a more sustainable and robust ecosystem overall. Yeah, it's um it's an interesting it's it's been an interesting journey, I think, to watch how how all of that has transitioned over the years. And I know that Denver has, you know, an emerging, like even inner, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Immersive art, uh, stuff going on. And, you know, you mentioned the murals and certainly if anyone is in the Denver area, I, I always recommend heading down to, uh, you know, to, to Rhino and checking out all the great, great art that is just everywhere down there. Um, it's really cool to see and it's, and it's spreading too. I mean, even up here in Netherlands, there, 
um, there are, there's a great big new mural that's, that's gone up on, on the side of one of the buildings. It's just amazing. Um, and, and so it's, it's this really amazing engagement that's happening with, within the art community where it's bringing everyone into the, into the focus. And I, I, I just really enjoy hearing how you're helping to, to foster that. What types of, what types of clients are you working with typically um, as, as, a, as, as at the CII? Yeah, absolutely. And before I get into that, I just wanted to speak a little bit more to something you were bringing up, which is just how much a part of our city it has become. And I really want to attribute that at least partially in to the idea that as a state and as a city, we have really bought into the economic argument, the business argument for art and for artists in society. And noticing that our state public art department, Colorado Creative Industries, was moved into the economic department, right? And now Boulder mm -hmm. is following suit as a city um, and considering doing the same. And so seeing sort of this vitality increase just through people seeing the value and through you know, grants that are pop popping up like arts and society. And so there's really been a lot of kind of paradigm shift as a culture and as a state that has led us into this place where we are now, you know, one Santa Fe arts district is only one of many arts district and you can tell people to go to Rhino. And I want to be sensitive also to the fact of the painful gentrification that, that has taken place, um, especially for racial minorities, um, you know, disabled people, people um, that have been multi multiple generation families in the Denver area community who may be pushed out even if they own their home due to property taxes, right? And so there is this really big economic vitality aspect, but there's also this aspect of erasure, right? We've seen a huge erasure of the DIY scene in Denver and DIY artists being pushed out. Um, you know, many of my artist friends are now in places like New Orleans or Detroit mm -hmm. or, you know, back where they grew up, where they can stay with family for a while. And so it's, it's also gotten infinitely more challenging to navigate the cost of living as a creative as well and and wearing those many hats right as a creative person and so it it, it comes with a balance um, and so I think that like the clients that I try and take on are a part of the ecosystem the creative ecosystem that is providing more in the realm of equitable arts access for all, right? Just going back to that. So public art departments, libraries, school systems, small businesses, businesses that serve and nonprofits that serve, um, you know, racial minorities, gender minorities, um, disabled people, um, neurodivergent people, and leaning into making what has already become a harder place for many to live a place that is becoming easier in the ways that I can impact it in the ways that I can spread creativity and then imagination and joy. Cause I'm luckily one of the folks who is a creative who is not pushed out, um, who is here sustainably for the long term, um, in part to, you know, raising children who ha I have co-parents here that I need to figure out ways to stay. Um, but it, it definitely is a different environment. And so I try to seek clients who are, are again, mission and vision aligned in, in the ways that, um, that make it sustainable for everybody to stay in Denver. Yeah. It is kind of ironic how Denver's not the only example of this, but Denver's the <laughs> the one that you and I both know the the best, probably, or at least I do. Um, you you probably know others <laughs> as as well, but you know the Rhino District has become you know it's it's the River North River North Art District. However, a lot of artists were displaced when developers started coming in and and building up, um, you know, building up the the industry, um, in that area, um, 
you know, it, it changed quite a bit from, from back in the day when, when it was, um, you know, either kind of all warehousey sort of, uh, you know, squatter type of, of living to what it is today. And, um, and so it's kind of, it's interesting how the, in order to build up that art district, they, they kind of booted out a lot of the artists and, and there's gotta be a balance there, right. Where, the, um, between, between that gentrification for lack of a better word to, you know, and to being able to give artists a, a, a bigger voice because, because there's more visibility. Um, have you seen ways that other cities have, have done that more effectively? Yeah, um, I have. I have seen many ways that cities have done that effectively. Um, and I just, I could go through so many examples like of just if people aren't familiar with Rhino, like you're talking about, not only artists that are displaced, but entire established venues like Hylicon va- Gallery was a place where there were illustration shows and a lot of illustrators had galleries for decades and they owned that building and they had to shut down the gallery within the last couple of years because property taxes became so unsustainable that even just paying the property taxes was not something that they could manage anymore. And so, you know, really finding ways that, you know, there could be even a economic department and kind of cultural equity department um, in tandem that sort of work to identify threats to the ecosystem and years in advance create economic funding to keep those things around. Because if we understand that economic development is really flourishing in our state because in part due to creativity and creative tourism. And we know that arts are helping our society be healthier, more sustainable, flourish, more economically driven. Then we need to give those opportunities and plan that funding for opportunities to give to those organizations who are establishing and well-established to stay in the places that they were established and belong. And so places I've seen do that well are all over. But my favorite example, given that we only have a certain amount of time today, Stu, is (laughs) Tom Finkelpearl um, is also a socially engaged artist, um, social practice artist in terms of like Tom Finkelpearl writes about um, socially engaged art, those two kind of terms used interchangeably. Um, And so not an artist himself, um, so excuse me, but writes about it. And so Finkel Pearl has a whole book on it, but is also um, in a government role in New York City and launched and oversees a program in the city that is a residency for artists in society. And so this artists in society program, they put forward half of the funding as the residency. And then they ask that whichever city department wants to engage puts forward half of the funding um, unless special arrangements are made. And then artists are invited in just to be a part of whatever space that is. And then at the end of their residency, they create some sort of creative output. So this could look like an artist going into jails for you know, an extended period of time and then working with the prisoners, offering workshops, um, offering kind of just community building and then coming out with a mural for the prison um, or, you know, a poetry book for the prisoners, something like that. Um, I know that a popular one was with the sanitation department because this whole idea was... um, sort of spurred by someone in the feminist performance art movement, Marielle Euclid. Um, And Euclid partnered with the sanitation department to actually like ride in trash trucks throughout New York City and washed the front stairs of a museum kind of as her art piece for that museum. And so just building on this tradition of like labor as 
artwork and mm-hmm. participation in society as artwork. Um, and so I, I think that New York does that really well through that residency. But I think there's a long way to go in terms of arts organizations, arts ecosystems, cultural environments beyond just the, you know, key museums, beyond just the science museum, the art museum, things like that. Receiving that different tiered funding and receiving those sort of emergent and emergency supports to keep them nested in the places that they may be helping to gentrify and would otherwise be be pushed out. So understanding the impact of arts and society and creating sustainable opportunities for funding and fundraising. Yeah, it's uh, it's this interesting challenge where people, well, there, there are a few things. <laughs> One of them is this idea that I love this place and, and I want to change it, um, which is always a, a, an interesting thing. So you, you know, you remember, uh, you know, I think it was, you know, the keep Portland weird, uh, movement back in the day, um, that, you know, was really trying to make sure that the people who came to that area because they loved the art scene or, or how funky it was, but then once they got there, they wanted to keep it from being, being that way, they wanted to change it. Um, and then, and then I also think that there's this idea of ecosystems and how we, you know, we, we can't live with, with one thing in exclusivity. We have to understand its place within, within this entire, um, ecosystem that, that it's a part of. And, and when, you know, when we don't have art, it's, you know, it's pretty bleak and, and so understanding that we have to keep these things alive is, is so important. And I love that, that you're helping to do that through, um, through all the great work that you're doing. So I can't believe it's been almost an hour since we started chatting. Um, can, how can people find out more about what you're, what you're doing and how can they help support your movement? Yeah. Um, you keep saying things that I'm like, I just need to speak on this one point. I would say like, for me, it's not even art, right? Art's great. But what are we thinking about when we think of art? Like, are we thinking of a colorful object and what's behind that? Creatives, creatives are behind that, right? And so getting engaged in places like um, transforming creatives that has the workspace in Rhino, um, Converge Denver, and, you know, their mission of basically investing in the health of creatives. I think that if that were adopted on more of a societal level, then we would be in great shape. I always tell my students that, and I would tell anyone listening to this who wants to be more creative, go to art school because the next generation is going to need creative thinkers and creative problem solvers to solve the problems that we face that are ginormous and stacking, right? And and finding that joy. Um, I think that creativity can only come when there's safety. Animals only play when they're safe, right? And so mm-hmm. it's kind of a gauge of our health as, as an economic ecosystem is if we have creatives that are thriving and flourishing. And so making sure that we have opportunities to support that. Um, you can find Creative Integration Initiative at Creative in, in excuse me, creative integration initiative.org or on Instagram at CII Art. Um, you can also find us just through a web search or at Converge Denver, like I just talked about, that is hosted by Transforming Creatives. So um, down on Brighton Boulevard across the street from the source. That's awesome. Um, I really appreciate you being on the show and talking with us today about um, about creativity and art and everything that you're doing to to make make that flourish and shine in both Denver and Boulder, um, and then beyond. You know, you're you're inspiring future generations of uh, of of creatives. Um, I really love having conversations, but I also really want people to take action. And so if people could take any action after listening to our show today, what would you have them do? Yeah, um, I would have them check into Tools for the Creative Life. It's a monthly series that I put on with a number of other organizations. And it's really a great way to increase kind of your 
mental health as a creative, your professional understanding. We do also just fun creative workshops and go back to the episode with Chloe Duplessis and, you know, manifest your creative goals. Go back to the episode on trauma informed creative practices and do a check in and make sure that your mental health is in a space where you can actually engage in your creativity, even if it's on only five minutes, three times a week at first. But just understanding that that's important and allowing yourself to value creativity in your life, whether that's baking or drawing or any other form, but just allowing yourself to value that for yourself and others and finding ways to bring that into your daily environment, whether it's your workplace or crafts at home with your kids. And feel free to reach out to me if you're looking for specific kind of ways to increase the creative sustainability and impact in your life. I love it. I hope everyone can take this uh, take this episode and go be more creative in whatever capacity you like to, to be creative. I think that's a, just an amazing uh, recommendation. So thank you so much for being on the show today, Teague. I really appreciate it and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Steve. Bye. And there you have it, another great episode of Relish This. Thanks again for listening. You can find past episodes of the show at relishthis.org. And remember, if you liked what you heard today, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information on purpose marketing, grab your free copy of my book, Mission Uncomfortable, How Nonprofits Can Embrace Purpose-Driven Marketing to Survive and Thrive. Get your copy now at missionuncomfortablebook.com. Thanks again for listening.